overtures and beginners. Right, our next speaker has uh, come a long way, and uh, he was coming here just to have a stall. But uh, because Robin Heath couldn't make it because he's not well, Dave has very kindly agreed to do a talk, and he's petrified. So <laughs> I want you all to be, to be very gentle with him, not ask him any difficult questions, okay? So his name's Dave Fadler. As you can see, his talk, uh, well, he runs the Archaeology and Metal Detector magazine. He also uh, has a, um, a, a, a weekly show, yes. the Big, Dete Big Detective Big Detective Show. Big yeah. Detective Show which gets about a thousand hits. Isn't that fantastic? And uh, like himself and me, we're a big fan of the uh, TV program, The Detectivists. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely brilliant. So uh, look it up online. Okay then, I'd like you to give a big warm welcome. What you're gonna talk about the Brystones near where he lives. And he's also gonna talk about all sorts of other interesting stuff. So you're in for a real treat. So can we have a big mysterious us welcome for Dave Sadler. And it's been, uh, it's been about 12 years since I last gave a presentation, so uh, please bear with me. Um, obviously, this weekend's speakers, they've been some fantastic speakers. I've uh, really have been enlightened in a lot of ways, and it's, uh, it's given me the, uh, the kick up the bum I needed to go back out there and, and look at things that I used to look at. Uh, anyway, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm the editor of the Archaeology and Metal Detective magazine, which is a free online magazine. Uh, but we also do, uh, for events, we do free magazines as well by the power of advertising. Uh, they pay me and I give out free magazines. So if you do want one a bit later on, we do have a load of free magazines there. Well, that's based on a metal detecting event this year. Uh, but some fantastic articles in there nonetheless. And on the website, archmdmag.com, you'll find all sorts of interesting things, links. Um, we've even got a education area as well. Uh, I host a show on Thursday nights. Sadly, I've fallen into this inadvertently, much as I did uh, speaking today. Uh, we had Neil on the show a couple of weeks ago. It's called The Big Detective Show. Uh, not necessarily what we cover. Uh, we cover everything. We've had people on from the uh, Lost Relics of the Knights Templar, a uh, good friend of mine, Steve Mira, Andrew Collins has been on the show, and of course, Neil. And I'll be hitting up several other people who've been speaking today to come on the show in the near future. Uh, this is live on a Thursday night, you just look on YouTube or on Facebook, you'll be able to find it. But, I live in Congleton, uh, and from the day I moved to Congleton, I heard about the Brightstones, because we've got a place there called the Brightstones Centre, and obviously I was, why is that called the Brightstones? And it turns out that there's a uh, Neolithic burial cairn on the border uh, the back of the Bosley Cloud, if you've heard of that, which has also got the Cat Stones and several other uh, Neolithic and Iron Age uh, buildings and structures upon it. So um, the Bright Stones, fantastic place. And bear with me as well, I am going to be reading from notes because I can't remember half of what I'm on about. So uh, this lies on the Cheshire and uh, Staffordshire border. Uh, you'll see it in a, in a little while, uh, an image of the Boundary Stone. Uh, it's at Timbers Brook, just behind the Bosley Cloud, as I say, so you can see it right there. Uh, some of you have been there, I know um, Kevin's been to, to the site, uh, and I know that uh, Andrew Collins has been there multiple times, Graham Phillips and, and many other people uh, who you'll know in the mysterious Earth realm. It's 250 metres above sea level. Uh, a bit of a close-up again. Now, sadly, there is a quarry right behind it where the uh, actually uh, representation of the location with the uh, altitude and whatnot. So, uh, the site itself, uh, it's go back to the 1700s. Um, Thomas was talking before about when things came to public knowledge, and it was around the 1700s that this first came to, uh, to the public perception from books and such like. Uh, the, the site itself, it, it, the original structure, many tons of the stone has been taken away. Uh, a lot of it exists in Tunstall, in the park in Tunstall, and, and other, uh, the local turnpike road has got a lot of the stone in it, as has the uh, adjoining house. 
Uh, lots of obviously ransacking occurred on the site for, for many years. Uh, there's evidence from a variety of sources that indicate that it was a chambered tomb of a massive proportions with a paved crescent forecourt and a porthole stone dividing the main chamber. The complex was supposedly 110 metres in length, with a horned cairn uh, being 11 metres wide. A report from the 18th century notes that in addition to the main chamber, which still stands today, a further two subsidiary ones were located at a distance of 55 yards, although these have not been found, uh, and they still don't know if it was to the east or the west. Uh, the Stoke-on-Trent Museum Archaeological Society have been recently uh, doing a lot of work on the site, geophysics and digs and whatnot. Might come to that a little bit later if we've got time. Have I finished yet? Can I go? <laughs> uh, chambered tombs with crescent forecourts are for, uh, normally found in the Clyde region of Scotland, uh, such as Cairn Holy and Cairn Ban, as well as in Ireland, uh, the Cork Cairns. No other examples are known from the English mainland, the closest being Welsh, hold on, Castell in Ard on the Isle of Man. Sorry, it's not Welsh, but it sounded Welsh. In addition to the paved forecourt, the Brightstones also had another interesting feature in a porthole of stone, a characteristic usually associated with chambered tombs from the Cotswold Severn region in in the case of the Brightstones, it divided the two compartments of the main chamber at 19 and a half inches. The hole would have been large enough for a person to call through. A stone of identical proportions found at the Devil's Ring and Finger in Staffordshire. Uh, this representation, this is um, it's more recent, although it's obviously an old, old drawing, it's probably from the 1800s. And this actually gives a, a good overview of what it looks like today. Again, this is another picture, an artist representation of what the Brightstones would have looked like. Beautiful sight. And this is again another artist representation of what they believed it would have looked like uh, many, many years gone by. Uh, these images uh, from G. Um, I've been allowed to use them by Doug Pickford, who've actually got the negatives in his possession. Doug Pickford, people who know the Earth Mysteries, uh, will know Doug uh, from the from Staffordshire. Um, marvellous person, marvellous mind of knowledge. So the question is, why is such an unusual monument built here? Cheshire is not a county known for its Neolithic architecture. In fact, from a few long barrows, the Brightstones are the only authentic Neolithic monument. The site has suffered much in the last two centuries, as well as in the thousands of tons that have been taken from the cairn, a number of the standing stones from the circle uh, form, forming the forecourt have also been removed. During the 19th century, a picnicker's bonfire led to the side slabs of the main chamber and a porthole stone being seriously cracked. In fact, the top of the porthole stone has long since disappeared. To add insult to injury, a local newspaper article reports that many years ago, an engineer engaged in the cutting of the Manchester Ship Canal visiting the spot actually used one of the biggest monoliths for the purpose of demonstrating uh, with a detonator, as a result of which the great stone was broken off close to the ground. Luckily the damage was not beyond repair and it was cemented back during these excavations in the 1930s. Uh, it's actually a close-up image of that in a little while. In recent years there have been a long-running debate as to which way the cairn at the Brightstone extended, a myth that it ran east of the chamber into the grounds of the neighbouring Brightstone's house rather than the west down the slope it was started by Mr Bertram B. Sims in an article in the Congleton Chronicle in 1936. Sims took the early references and reinterpreted the monument. The Brightstone's chamber was originally capped with a huge slab. The one monolith is all that remains of the pear-shaped arrangement of similar pillars, some 12 feet high, which into space with stones as walls and capped with slabs, formed another chamber, hall or chapel, approximately 30 foot by 44 foot, uh, where fire ritual ceremonies were performed to se sever the spirits of the dead chief from earthly things, it is thought. Uh, the stones that survived are now fenced off in the corner of a field, and it is a very, very small site, and it's a site that um, I personally, as I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, it upsets me greatly that the site isn't looked after as well as I believe it should be. Um, 
everything becomes overgrown. You can't get in there sometimes because nobody looks after it. Instead, in fact, there should be some form of uh, group set up to actually support the Brightstones, look after it, given the obviously the uh, permission of the uh, the National Trust. I think it is. Uh, the stones that have survived are now fenced off in the core of the field, surrounded by yews, rhododendrons and conifers, and overgrown with bracken in the summer. The site's in desperate need of attention and recognition. The quarry to the rear of the site employs several large, noisy and angry rottweilers, devaluing the privacy and peacefulness of the site. Many visitors also leave behind the rubbish and the dog dirt. Additionally, quarry owners have somehow received planning permission for several large new builds around the site. The general overall fear of such an ancient and significant place is slowly being eroded. It's one of them sites that, because of everything that's going on around it, if you do visit, visit sooner rather than later because it's, uh, again, with, with the building and the quarry, uh, with the amount of traffic on the road alongside, it's getting worse and worse there. It still occupies a magnificent spot. Its beauty and occasional tranquility provide many visitors an escape from modern day hustle and bustle. Did you, did you, does he realise this is an article I wrote that I'm actually reading out? <laughs> I'm not Robin here. Uh, I have in the past penned a letter to the National Monuments Authority expressing my concerns of the site state and hopefully its future protection. Bizarrely, this is a site that lots of people in Congleton, they know it's there, they've never visited um, ever. And it's it's a great walk uh, to it, but people haven't got a clue. And incidentally, my children through school, I can't understand why the Brightstones is never discussed on the school curriculum being so close. Uh, now, in the past, as uh, I've mentioned to a few people, I used to be involved in uh, paranormal investigation uh, from a parapsychological perspective. And um, I was collating um, reports of profound human experiences from the site, be it balls of light in the sky, UFOs, uh, there's been people passing out, there's been people with lost time, there's been a hell of a lot of peculiar events taking place at the Brightstones. So I wanted to look a little bit deeper into this uh, from a parapsychological and a scientific perspective. Uh, I'm no academic, academic. Uh, this is all obviously self-taught, uh, things that I've learned in the past. But I wanted to look at everything I could to try and understand why this site was here and why people are reporting so many profound human experiences. Uh, during one visit to the site, I thought I'd add some technology to it. Um, and I took an abundance of um, meters, in particular EMF meters, electromagnetic field meters. And I set up to record the measurements in the area uh, I was able, actually, to record a low fluctuating measurement in an area external of the tomb. Uh, noted all this, went back multiple more times to try and gather data from the entire area around the site uh, in different um, conditions, be it weather conditions, times of the year, etc, etc. Um, I did go back again, I had the Gauss meter with me at one point, uh, and it gave me Again, several beeps. Sometimes it was flat, sometimes it was nothing. And I also didn't use my mobile, take my mobile phone with me because mobile phones emit an EMF. Even if you're having some form of uh, text message coming through or you're picking up a satellite, it will give off a signal and that'll be picked off by the EMF meter. So on one of the uh, visits, I've begun to emit a drum beat emission. Again, the signature EMF was present. I entered the chamber itself and used four different EMF meters and uh, received on the Gauss meter, uh, which, and I used a multi-axis meter and a single axis meter. So one was a wide span and one was a direct um, recording. Um, I was getting quite high uh, amounts of milligauss, so obviously there was some electrical emissions in the area. I then entered the tomb itself, uh, and it, this was very peculiar. So I'm inside the ins I forgot all about pictures here, haven't I? Carrying on. This was the, um, the concrete, uh, how they fixed the concrete back in 1936. I think it was the last time anything's actually been done at the site. Uh, and as you can see, it's a very, very small site. 
So uh, the parking itself, the lane up to the site, is actually the entrance way to the Brightstone Stones Quarry. So that sometimes it can get quite uppity about people parking there and there's nothing on the main road, so more of a, a walking distance. <coughs> this is the, uh, the boundary marker between Cheshire and Staffordshire. Now this is, I've been up a lot of times and there's been different offerings left by people, be it uh, vegetation, herbs, etc., etc. And people have suggested in the past it's a Roman altar, but it's actually a boundary stone. And these are some of the stones taken from the site. Uh, this is the, the road, as I say, up to the site. These are some of the stones that are, are, are there that were robbed on from the bride stones itself. That's one of the monoliths that was split, as I mentioned. So this is the uh, inside itself. So I'm inside there and I've got the, uh, the MF meter and it's given a vast emission. It's constantly going off. There's only me there. Uh, I have no, nothing electrical in here. Uh, there's no electrical lines, pylons, etc. close by. Uh, it was a quiet part of the day, so the quarry was short. So I'm intrigued as to why this EMF is being emitted at this point within the tomb itself. Now, jumping away, I'll come back to that momentarily. Uh, I've got a geological map we'll have a look at in a little bit. But uh, it actually shows there are two fault lines within a mile of the site. Uh, geological faults are scientifically proven to produce electrical discharges during seismic activity in the UK. A lot of people don't realise we have a hell of a lot of seismic activity. Um, so th these tectonic plates, these, uh, these, these fault lines are constantly rubbing together. Uh, if, if you subscribe to Paul Devereux, which I do, his earth -like theories, uh, this is one of the ways, obviously, the tectonic plates are rubbing together, causing these balls of plasma energy to uh, dissipate into the atmosphere. Absolutely fascinating. I've actually got a recording of one of these taken from uh, Up Holland, uh, the hill up in Up Holland looking towards Winter Hill. Uh, well, actually, I haven't got it. Uh, a guy called Ian Kasher Cameron's got it, and I keep meaning to get it back because I gave him the video years ago and forgot about it. But he's transferred it to digital and hopefully I'll be able to put something together in the near future regarding that. So there's two fault lines. One's known as the Red Rock Fault and one's the Mel Cop Fault, a branch of which runs directly through the field adjacent to the site. So um, this is basically where this fault line is in relation to the Bridestones. It's that close. And this is looking from the Bridestones. As you can see, the line, the, the, the valley undulates and goes downhill towards Mount Cop, which is a, uh, a folly, a, a, a castle folly um, in Biddulph, more or less, uh, Staffordshire. So this goes down and this uh, the, the fault lines run accordingly, coming up this hill. We'll get back to that momentarily. The site's geological content is that of carbon ferrous material, a base of iron ore, and is a known conductor of electrical energy. The site sits uh, exactly on a watershed between rivers draining to the Mersey and the Irish Sea and the Trent and North Sea. Again, and obviously a known conductor. So you've got water running underneath, deep underground, streams deep underground. Uh, the buildings to the rear of the site belong to the quarry. The natural methods of quarrying may have caused additional faults to occur around the site. Again, seismic activity may cause the electrical buildup in this area. Finally, and there's an image right at the end for some reason, don't know why I put it there, it shows a band of copper running directly through the site. So you've got all these little things, you've got your water, you've got your carbon ferrous material, and you've got your copper all running, and obviously the seismic activity. So uh, if you can imagine the, the electrical energy uh, is, is, is formed by the tectonic plates rubbing together, and all these different things are allowing energies to be passed alongside and through them. Uh, I contacted a professor at Manchester University to discuss the reasons behind a lot of power uh, batteries power draining. I, I was part of a team making a Canadian TV series called Ghost Cases and we went to the site and in and around the tomb itself their camera, and this is a professional camera crew, they make feature films and such like, the batteries were being shut down within an instant uh, and, and this is one of the reasons I contacted the professor. 
And I quote uh, what he said, a magnetic field can have unpredictable effects on electronic device. As most electronic components are not affected by such a field, it is a certain possibility for a strong electromagnetic field or a rapidly fluctuating magnetic field to interfere with certain components of the mobile phone, causing it to drain power faster. However, a small magnet such as a magnetic clasp on a mobile phone case is largely harmless. So yes, an electromagnetic field can cause battery drainage. Then we discussed the tomb and uh, obviously where, where I was getting emissions within the tomb itself. You can see, uh, I've got a clue how to go back, but obviously we, we've seen, oh there you go, this, this is the uh, geological map. So the bright stones is about here. The red, uh, the Malcott line and the red row, Malcott fault line runs that way and the red rock fault runs that way and one of the spurs comes within a few hundred yards of the burial chamber. Uh, the tomb itself, as I said, all this energy, he believes, uh, and my belief is, all this energy within the tomb, from the copper, from the water source, from the iron, etc., etc., is going through and causing that to be like a cell of a battery. So all this energy stored within that tomb is like electrical energy. Again, we're going to come on to this, is where I start to theorise momentarily about uh, things that people are, uh, why people are experiencing what they're experiencing, not only here, but potentially in other ancient sites around the UK and the world. Uh, and I may be long, if this is my belief, it's not my belief to force upon yourself, it's something for you to have a think about. A lot of people, obviously, we've heard a lot of theories behind things this weekend, <coughs> within tombs, within burial chambers, within ancient sites around the world. So, Known variously as electromagnetic hypersensitivity, electrical hypersensitivity, electrosensitivity, and a host of other terms, electromagnetic sensitivity syndrome, and we'll call it ES from now on, is a physiological disorder characterized by symptoms directly brought on by exposure to electromagnetic fields. It's a serious public health concern and the incidence of ES is growing. So you can imagine the amount of electrical things we've got in the UK. We're surrounded by it now, the lights, projector, computer, we've all got them at home. Uh, we've got pylons, there's so much electrical energy in the, in the UK and people do get ill from it. And it's something that's not looked at, it's something that people don't realise that the electric clock at the side of your head uh, you know, you, you, you're having that all the time and it's going to be affecting you. It's affecting everybody. Uh, and it, I'll, I'll talk about a case um, in, in, a, in a short while that I was involved in in Tatton Hall in Cheshire, which uh, explains more or less exactly what's going on. So a typical Britain is a near continuous interaction with the sim stimulation from across the electromagnetic spectrum. The density of radio waves around us is now 100 million to 200 million times the natural level reaching us from the sun. There's increasing awareness that humans are responding to electromagnetic radiation in a variety of ways. EMFs are invisible fields of energy produced wherever electrical current is flowing. So let's think about the site again, about the water, about the copper, about the iron. EMFs are biologically active and a great deal of information exists regarding the health effects of EMF stimulation on animals, including humans. Evidence has now come to light that EMF exposure may cause many more problems than had been contemplated, and this includes the phenomenon of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I work at JCB, and one of the jobs there is uh, age hardening. So basically, a part goes through a very, very hot circle uh, and heats it up, super heats it up and then cools it down to harden the material. I took the EMF meter into work one day and it went off the scale. So the person who's working there is constantly getting all sorts of electromagnetic harm. And I actually brought this up at a health and safety meeting and got laughed out. So hey, that's what people think about that. ES is a disorder whereby neurological and allergic type symptoms are brought on through exposure to electromagnetic fields. 
Many individuals with ES are primarily sensitive to certain frequencies of EMF. And there's a wide range in the degree of sensitivity exhibited in those affected. The incidence of electro-sensitivity is growing. Many people experience an abrupt onset of symptoms following exposure to a novel EMF, such as fields associated with a new computer, working in front of a computer all day, uh, new fluorescent lights, etc. Symptoms often are not immediately recognised by the injured as having been brought on by EMF exposure. Onset of ES has also been reported following chemical exposure. More research on the phenomena is urgently needed in order to understand the mechanism behind it. It appears, however, that there is some direct effect upon the nervous system and the immune system is likely also involved in the disorder. Symptoms, and please think about this, some of the things I'm going to say, you might actually have some of these symptoms yourself and not realise it, and, and you know, you might be affected. Move away from the electricity, get outdoors, get to the stone circles, get walking more so you're away from the electricity. Uh, headaches, eye irritation, dizziness, nausea, skin rash, facial swelling, weakness, fatigue, pain in the joints, muscles, buzzing, ringing in the ears, skin numbness, abdominal pressure and pain, breathing difficulties, irregular heartbeat. Uh, you can even go as far as paralysis, balance problems, muscle spasms, convulsions, confusion, depression, difficulty in concentration, seizures, sleep disturbances and memory difficulties. I have most of them. Uh, and I, I've always thought it was related to uh, medical conditions. I've got many medical conditions, sadly. Uh, but, you know, all these are also related to the clock at the side of my head, being on the computer all the time, working in an electric environment where I work. You know, if I take all that away, mind you saying that when I'm off work for a period of time, uh, I was clinically extremely vulnerable, so I was off work for six months. I probably felt a little bit better than I did at work. Was that being off work and being happier? Was that being away from everything I'm usually subjected to? It's a, it's a funny old thing. When I mentioned earlier about the case that we were involved in, uh, in Tatton Hall, I'm looking at the clock here and I'm actually gonna do this very quickly. I'm gonna have to drag you out a bit. So, uh, I had a radio show on BBC Radio Merseyside with uh, Roger Lyon on a Friday night uh, talking about the paranormal and such like. And uh, a lady contacted us and asked us to go to her home. Now, she was all sorts of, uh, what can we say, psychic visions uh, and such like, all, all, all these paranormal experiences. And her son uh, was having a hell of a lot of, I can't remember the exact thing, it was something like multiple cirrhosis. It wasn't that, I can't remember what it was exactly. But her son was having all these effects and he had to take the son away from the house. Now, as I say, there was all these manner of amazing things that were going on. Now, we, we were looking all over the place. We had the um, frequency monitors to see if there was uh, frequencies from the, from the local tower on top of Hellsby Hill hitting the house. We were looking at the electrical pylons, etc., etc. There were so many different things that we were looking at that the people could have these things. And we were getting high um, readings of EMF throughout the house. It was only one night that the husband the fourth or fifth time we've been there it was only the, the the night that the husband went out to the cow shed put the cows on that this absolutely went skyrocketed so the emf they were living in was actually subjected to it was it was really really affecting the whole family now uh we think we found out what the problem was but we weren't sure so we asked the teams to come in from bristol university who actually monitored the site uh, with all the professional equipment and found the spikes of electromagnetic frequency there, uh, they were unhealthy. People shouldn't have been living in a house. And we found out exactly what it was by the university. There's a transformer on the outside of the house on a pole, and whenever the lights were put on in the cow shed, this was an old transformer and it emitted so much discharge it was untrue. So they contacted the energy supplier, I can't remember who it was at the time, who came along, finally admitted, yes, that could be the case, we will change this. They changed it, the paranormal events started dropping, the son's health improved, and basically the family got back to normal. All this from a transformer that was knackered, emitting so much EMF. 
I lost where I was otherwise. Um, some people may experience a report paranormal-like phenomena resulting from the exposure to the high amplitude of domestic electromagnetic field. Prolonged exposure to the high amplitude EMF may increase the amount of reported paranormal activity. Additionally, factors being responsible for the actual the actual nature of the reported phenomena, including an individual's susceptibility, exposure time, and socio-cultural beliefs. The presence of an EMF of sufficient high amplitude in combination with the weaker, weaker complexities within the overall EMF signal may increase the likelihood of otherwise unaffected people reporting experiences, which they then interpret as being paranormal in origin. As the overall amplitude of the AMF increases, a greater number of people will become susceptible to having such experiences. Let's jump back over several hundred millennia. We didn't have electric, it wasn't around, but sites like the Brightstones, potentially, with all the things I mentioned earlier, were having these um, more or less electrical events going on. People didn't know that, it wasn't that we, we didn't know about it back then. So, were people in ancient times affected by, uh, were they more susceptible to um, electromagnetic frequencies on these electrical events? And were they actually building these locations uh, in where they were most prominent? So they were actually um, experiencing some of the likes of the shamanic events and such like, things that were going on there. Uh, profound human experiences in that day and they thought well this besides this must be something of consequence their religion their beliefs at that time let's build a monument here let's build a burial chamber for that person because this is where things are going on was it something like that or was it something quite simple as a beautiful view you know we want to put them here because it's a fantastic view um, there's so many different ways we can go with this, with the electromagnetic fields, uh, ES and what have you. Uh, that's the copper vein that I mentioned earlier. There's the bright stones, and that's where the copper vein runs. A lot of people looked at this, Doug Pickford, uh, Kevin Kilburn, many people have looked at the bright stones, and uh, it, it is a fascinating place. Back to myself and the archaeology and metal detecting magazine. In fact, actually, as I said, if, if you want to look more at the the, uh, the information found by the Stoker Trent Museum Archaeological Society, all the geophys results is all available on their website, all the information, all their findings and the test bits, uh, which were more or less taken from where the um, fault line occurs. That's all there on their website, so you'll be able to find out that, no problem. Uh, the Archaeology of Metal Detecting Magazine, I'm going to go back to that for a little bit. Uh, basically, we exist. Uh, it was founded to help my mental health. Uh, I was off work for a period of time and I needed something to get my brain working again. So I wanted to create something where people could have access to information for free. Uh, there's so many places you have to subscribe to to get this and get that and the other. But I wanted to be able to create somewhere where there's a hub for information which was why the magazine was formed originally. Just a little website pointing to links. Uh, it grew, we got 26,000 followers on Facebook. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in everybody's feed because one of our admins put a post on that Facebook decided wasn't very nice. So uh, this, this information is news. That, that's basically the news source. Everything that runs through there are news articles that we share from throughout the world, metal detecting, archeology, span um, anything really, weird stuff even. Um, the website itself, the all articles on there are either sent to us by people like yourselves who want to include a, an article on whatever it may be, promote something for us to review, etc, etc. And the magazine, as I say, which is available over there, we've got some available still, we're able to give that away by um, advertising. Hopefully, um, at the next Mysterious Earth event, we'll be able to put something together so it's actually looks at mysterious earth things people could put articles in regarding that and it looks at stuff directly involved in that and uh, i'm about 40 minutes early but uh, I'm, I'm i'm out of words i've uh, not done this for a while but uh, there you go 
That was the Bridestones, uh, the history, uh, some of the archaeology, um, my theories and thoughts and findings at the site. And as I say, it's a site that you need to go to sooner rather than later. And it's, it's within an area that you can have a good tour. You can pop up to the Cat Stones, you can pop up to the Bull Stones, uh, Dove Holes, Arbolo. It's all in a very, very close Thor's Cave, all in a very, very good area. Um, so, so please pay it a visit, show it some homage, and um, let people know that it exists and it's easily accessible and things are going down the pan. So that's me. Thank you very much. Finished a little bit early. We've got time for some questions. If uh, anybody's got anything they want to add, to, add to that, or ask them a question. I'm sure we'd be happy to answer. Question. A little. Bit. It's about an hour early. Yeah. <coughs> Take as long as you like with this. <laughs> um, so you talked about this electro electric fields around us in our homes, which I can certainly resonate with. You, if you excuse the pun, but. Uh, What's your feelings about Wi-Fi, the impact of Wi-Fi in our living environment? Again, this is all unnatural things, all waves, all, all, all related to the same thing, more or less, things that are uh, not natural to, to us, the human, and things that we are susceptible to. More people, some more so than others. And, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's harming us individually. But there's so much is about, we can't do anything about it. Yeah, we could... We could um, put a Faraday cage in our house and live in a Faraday cage where we're not touched by anything, but that's not that's not what we're going to do. Uh, unfortunately, in our cars, in our homes, everywhere. When I mentioned earlier about these um, the frequency uh, thing that we had, basically the amount of frequencies that we're picking up was was phenomenal. Uh, another case that we actually looked at, uh, interestingly, was in Liverpool, and a gentleman was having very very profound experiences again and we found that the frequency was direct on the uh, the wave in his house was from uh, a Liverpool ambulance um, bandwidth and it was hitting his house and he actually did put a Faraday cage for those of you who don't know it's basically let's say you go into your room uh, be it a cube and run it round with copper wire all the way around and that basically won't allow certain things into it in short that's not the scientific professional version, that's the Dave easy bit. Uh, so, again, Faraday Cage is put into place. We stopped having the experiences, experiences, but yeah, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, this all affects each and every one of us. And uh, we can't do anything about it, sadly, unless we have some absolutely brilliant um, solar flare that cuts out all the electronic power in the world. <laughs> Anyone else? I feel like I'm on question time. Yes, yeah, it's not a question. It'd be a good avenue of research to do sort of monitor electrical activity at, that, at other sort of slow monument sites. Because I feel we've become so sort of desensitised to the natural rhythms of Earth. We're totally surrounded by electricity. And as you say, if there are sort of electrical pulses in the Earth that our ancestors could probably feel and sense, by having sort of visions or shamanic experiences, that um, you know, if, if we did have a coronal mass ejection, for example, it'd knock out all the electricity. So we'd be back to where we were thousands and thousands of years ago to perhaps experience what our ancestors went through. But yeah, it's it's an interesting area. And, and how much better would we all feel? <laughs> Think, thinking about what I've said, how much better would we all feel from taking away just that? I mean. Hopefully, it does happen and I'll feel good. <laughs> Who needs cars? Got a bike. I'll leave you over there. You might be here till three o'clock. <laughs> uh, that, that was really interesting. I was, you. You, you said you were reading from an article. Is that article on your website? or? Yes, yes, this article is on the website in full with lots of the images that I've included and such like. <laughs> if you just go onto archmdmag.com, if you pick up one of the magazines, all the information you're about to find, it's on there. 
as I say, it's a free app as well, so you can sit on the toilet in the morning and read it while you're doing whatever you're doing first thing in the morning. I do it, I don't know what's on there. <laughs> and it's a search search um, search thing on there, so you just put in the bright stones and you'll be able to find it. Uh, but there's also uh, subsections as well, so if you want to look at metal detecting articles, look at the metal detecting and all the articles are coming for that. Archaeology, etc., etc., everything's in tagged in different things so it appears in the correct area you want to look at. This is the most questions anybody's had all weekend. What's <laughs> happening? That's what you get for finishing early. Yeah. It's more like, um, uh, just to add to it really, you know, like the Bride Stones place. I watched um, a short thing about it and they said that they reckoned that um, it was the last resting place of the, the last druid um, of, of of England or something like that. So that was really interesting because I thought like that could be the last remnants of the pagans or the druids or something like that. There's also been suggestions, bride, be it the bride, be it a female burial, uh, yeah. be it the chieftain of the area, uh, because wow, it, it, going on to the archaeological and the metal detecting, I know a lot of what goes on locally because people tell me all the things that they found and within <sighs> Within, say, five miles, there's one of the biggest burial mounds I've seen in the north of the UK. It's just a massive field. Uh, I don't think it's been excavated properly. It's known, it's there. But I know of four Bronze Age axes that have been picked up from different areas. One was a, a metal detecting event that I actually ran. So there's all the evidence of, of, of different cultures. And uh, a friend of mine, two friends of mine, Mark and Joe, uh, again, this article's on the website. If you've ever heard of the Leak Frith Gold Talk Hoard, they actually discovered, going back to the car because one of them didn't feel very well, um, £375,000 worth of 99% uh, gold um, talks back in 2016. So all the, this area is massively, it, it's obviously got all the history of different uh, people being there. So there's lots of different... Yeah thoughts as to who was actually buried there. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And Peter's got a question for you. Peter's going to absolutely rip me to shreds now. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to bang a drum on the head. <laughs> now I haven't got a question. Great talk. I'm not sure the ancients did know about the power. That's why you, know, you, you suggested. But you might want to follow up a, a book called Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. By John Burke, you were asking whether they knew about the power. And this guy's done research on a lot of pyramids, especially in Mesoamerica, but also in some uh, chambered tombs where they found remains of seeds. And he reckons by some experiments he's done with plants, taking them into pyramids temporarily, he's found that the agriculture was enhanced and the seeds, um, you know, grow quicker. So you might want to check that out because I'm pretty sure that's what some of these chambered tombs for. Sue and I took some uh, seeds into uh, West Kennet Longborough uh, and left them there for a while. But I don't think we left them there long enough because we didn't notice any changes. But you might want to, uh, I've got the details of the book there. Thanks, right. to, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't remember it. So uh, yeah, John Burke's Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty is actually taking seeds into sacred sites. And he reckons that's one of the reasons the pyramids especially were built. So you might want yeah, to relate that to the bride stones. I always see it as bridey stones as well. It's Bridey's stones, isn't it? I think. Well, there's another one. And the uh, goddess Todd Bride, Bridget. as well. Yeah. Uh, bride stones at Todd Morgan yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but but th this weekend has been completely enlightening for me. I've been away from doing talks for such a long time. And um, I've been to Mysterious Earth type conferences in the past. But listening to Peter and uh, Hugh Thomas this weekend, it's, it's actually spurred me to go on. Especially Hugh's talk yesterday about giants because a lot of the research I was doing in the past was about the child of hail, um, the giants of hail. And, um, you know, it's I've heard of things in the past, I've watched TV documentaries, and what Hugh said yesterday is, has definitely spurred me on to look a little bit deeper and uh, find the giant bones that he's looking for. That was supposed to be in a Star Wars way then. <laughs> <laughs> in case you don't know, uh, Bride, uh, had, it's her... her um, a ritual, uh, you know, a date is the 2nd of February and uh, it's called Imbolc, which means uh, used milk. And it's been Christianized as uh, candle mass. Yeah. Mm. 
So that's the uh, Feast of Bride, or St. Bridget, as she's become now. And also in Ireland, um, there's more wells dedicated to St. Bridget, i.e. Bride, than there are St. Patrick. You might be interested to learn. And now here's Peter with a question. Steve, but you were close. Oh, Steve, Steve, yeah, sorry. You were close. You've got Peter on my mind. <laughs> not, not a lot of people know that. <laughs> You've uh, done a lot of electrical investigation uh, at the site. Have you done any uh, dowsing work or you know, investigating energy lines? To be honest, no. Um, and the reason would be because um, during the, the period of time that I was looking at that in depth, uh, my mind was elsewhere, it was looking at the scientific side of stuff. I've never tried dowsing, I've always promised that I would try dowsing. Um, maybe it's about time I did, so, you know, there's, there's stuff that I could do there. And to be able to go there and douse, I'd have to try and fully understand what I'm looking for and what the, the crossing of the rods or the going out of the rods would actually mean. Uh, because, as I say, there's so many things that are the water sources, wouldn't be the copper vein, I, I, I wouldn't know. It's like a computer, you, yeah. you tune your mind to whichever one you want to find. Yeah, I'm rubbish on computers as well. well me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, please, as I say, the app's free, download it, you can see it's there, have a look. Um, contact me if you want to put anything on the website. Um, the big detecting show that I mentioned, yay, uh, just have a search for that. We're live on a Thursday now. This week we've got some guys from a, a group called Miller's Detecting. Um, but I am going to hit up, I've told you I'll be emailing, Thomas is going to get subjected to it as well. I'm going to ask uh, Peter and Sue as well, so you know we do look at, the name doesn't exactly uh, tell you what the subjects are covered. Um, we take the subjects very, very, very seriously, but myself and my co-host Adrian absolutely don't whatsoever. Thanks again, everyone. Thank okay, you. I think we'll wrap it up there. Then, can I sh can you can show your appreciation to Dave Sadler one more time. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to have another uh, tea and coffee break now, which will probably come as a surprise to the kitchen staff. <laughs> so we'll see you in about half an hour. <laughs>